Hi there, this is a special holiday edition of Power and Politics. I'm David Cochran. Today, we are counting down the top five newsmakers that dominated Canadian politics in 2023. Who drove the biggest stories and stirred up the most political drama? We've got a special power panel here to look back at who dominated this year's news cycle. Laura D'Angelo is the vice president at Enterprise Canada. Tim Powers is the chair of Summa Strategies. Jordan Leichnitz is the Canada program manager for the Frederick Ebert Foundation. And Sherelle Evelyn is the managing editor of The Hill Times. All right, happy holidays, everyone. Let's get right into it. Ranking at number five on our top Canadian political newsmakers list for 2023. Ontarians will always access the health care they need with their OHIP card. We have signed a deal with Stellantis. We need the, the federal government to come to the table. No one can influence the Fords, no one, first of all. Not to mention a $150 stag ticket. I don't give two hoots about developers, I care about the people. I'm, I'm sending a warning shot right now. If you're holding on to land and you have permits, you better start building. I'll be reversing the changes we made and won't make any changes to the green belt in the future. We admit our mistakes. I've come out here, we've apologized, we're moving forward. I had nothing to do with the changes in the green belt. Ontario Premier Doug Ford is number five on this year's list of top newsmakers. Uh, Jordan, let's start with you. That's a premier of big decisions and bold backtracks. <laughs> yes, his time I was just going to say, leaning in and leaning really <laughs> far out. <laughs> yeah, so, I, I mean, the green belt would be, I, I guess, the number one thing, but also big investments in auto plants, so <clears throat> changing on a decision on the Peel region. What's your sense on Doug Ford? Uh, I think he had a really mixed year, for sure. There were there were definitely some highlights. I think, I think the auto plants were a big one, getting, securing that kind of major investment with jobs is really on brand for him. So that, that was a strong point. And then an, another highlight came later in the year with a new deal with Toronto, where, where he mm. and Olivia Chow, maybe uh, Canadian politics' most unlikely couple, um, <laughs> have managed to get done what previous mayors in Toronto couldn't. And I think that was really welcome for him after everything that happened in between, which was much less favorable. So we saw... Uh, I think most headline grabbingly, of course, was the step back on the green belt. Mm -hmm. And this, I think, was the most dangerous scandal for him that he faced this year because it really goes to the core of what we know is a weakness in voter perception of him, which is the potential that he might do things that benefit his friends rather than regular people first. And so his step back on that, I think, was really significant. Tim, he's kind of the, I've, I've decided, described him as the hokey pokey premier, right? He puts the policy in. <laughs> <laughs> he takes the policy out, you know, puts it back in and shakes it all about. And where it goes, who knows? And we saw it during COVID and we've seen it during this year where he announces something and then backtracks quickly and constantly readjusts. Well, it's rare that I'm going to be the, the, the more modern of you and Jordan. So if Doug Ford <laughs> were on TikTok, he'd be a constant dance meme because he goes everywhere, the hokey yeah. pokey, to your point. Um, what's fascinating, though, is uh, another dated term. He's got Teflon. I mean, we, we saw him in the summer struggling early fall when, as Jordan mentioned, the whole Greenbelt decision and the back and forth and the controversy around whether developers were favored or they weren't favored and who went to the stag and the doe and all of that was playing out and we were doing some polling with Abacus at the time that showed that that would, was really cutting at Ford, that right. people thought he favored insiders. As we sit here on the eve of, uh, of, of 2024, Doug Ford has a healthy lead over his opponents. Um, stuff that would have stuck to other politicians, and we've seen this throughout his tenure, just doesn't stick to this man. You do have to wonder what sort of uh, magic elixir he has. And right now, again, he looks like he's done enough course correcting, though he does have a new, arguably more capable opponent in, right. uh, in Bonnie Crombie. Uh, but uh, true to form, uh, they're already out uh, launching some heavy advertisements to define her. So again, it's away from Doug Ford. His polling continues to, to stay where it was. And I'm sure there are more than a few premiers across this country who wish they had Doug Ford's luck. Well, you know, Sherelle, some of it is that uh, for all of the issues and controversies, he's not ideological and he is willing to change. Yes. Which, you know, uh, I made fun of it kind of lightly, but that is, you, you do want leaders to respond to shifts in public opinion. And boy, this guy 
guy does. Right? Absolutely. You want leaders to respond to shifts in public opinion. You want people to change their minds when they're presented with new information that you know contradicts previous information. Part of the issue with Doug Ford, though, is that some of the information that he's had hasn't contradicted what came before it, but he just <laughs> plowed ahead anyways. Yes. Yeah, I mean, what we're seeing now uh, in the more recent weeks with you know the decision about um, the Peel region, I mean, trying to it's like this saying, oh, I didn't know it would cost so much. It's a kind of a bit of a weird flex because this has been in the works for a very long time. The government passed legislation on it, you know, a while ago. So these are all things that should have been figured out. The Greenbelt uh, proposal, like those were things, those were heavily studied, heavily consulted, and they just kind of plowed ahead and did what they wanted to do anyways, the Ford right. government. So yes, it's great for, for him to change his mind. And we do see, and we, like we saw during COVID and various things, when people when people are upset, you know, the, the quote unquote common folk, uh, when they when they express disappointment and, 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 and displeasure with what it is that the Ford, Ford himself is doing, um, that's when we do see him step back. And, you know, mm. to Tim's point, though, we also do also see these um, these new opponents uh -huh. uh, with Olivia Chow, with uh, potentially Bonnie Crombie. Yeah. We don't know how well that's going to turn out. Um, when we when he has somebody um, that he maybe more, more respects or that can stand up to him a little bit more, we saw it with the federal government. He yep. became really buddy-buddy with Christian Freeland. They yeah. developed a good rapport. Um, things change, and he tends to work really well and find those compromises as a, instead of just plowing ahead. Right. And, and, you know, Laura, uh, you know, we were kind of having some fun with it, but like the Greenbelt controversy is the potential for a real government threatening scandal as the RCMP is looking into this is subject of a police investigation. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this is a premier who does respond to public opinion because, you know, pollsters have to get people on their cell phones. He gives the people his cell phone, <laughs> you know, so they're yeah. calling him, you know, to let him know what they think. Yeah, I mean, this is a premier who, to your earlier point, David, when he apologizes, truly gets up and says, I'm sorry, which is really interesting. He gives out his cell phone number. He He's very approachable. I think, you know, everyone sees the jokes and the memes about how many times he says folks mm. in anything he says, but that is actually who he is. What I think is really interesting is what Sherelle was talking about, which is actually his collaborative attitude. I think it's mm -hmm. quite unique in Canadian politics across the board right now. He will work almost much more like a municipal politician than a partisan politician and work with anyone who's willing to come to the table and help him achieve his goals. Right. And that, uh, Jordan, this is a final point, is a big change in Doug Ford from the initial time in the premier's office very early in assignment to, to now because yes. he was very kind of, I guess, the management and the staff he had at the time, very ideological and combative mm. and less so now. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, I think in fairness, this is maybe more likely the true the true guy, the true guy yeah. who's settled into the role. And, he, and I think he's he's matured into it to some degree. But yeah, he's also getting advice that says be a pragmatic populist. That is who he is. And and I think that the art of the apology is absolutely mm -hmm. core to his success. It's an undervalued thing in politics mm -hmm. to be able to credibly deliver an apology that actually resonates with voters and reestablishes trust when there's been a breach, like you've seen in the Green Belt. And so the fact that, you know, as Tim pointed out, that he's ending the year with strong numbers after the kind of year he's had, not just with Green Belt, but with Peel Region, with MZOs, with all these mm -hmm. other things, is really a testament uh, to, to that advice and, and his ability to execute it. It's because he's ending the year by freeing the beer. You're going to be able to get beer <laughs> and wine practically everywhere in Ontario now. Okay, Doug Ford was number five on our list. Let's get to the number four for Political Newsmaker of the Year. When I hear the words just transition, it signals eliminating jobs. The ball is now in the Prime Minister's court. This election is a choice between moving forward or going back. Every single vote is going to make a difference. A strong, stable, united, conservative, majority government. I cannot, under any circumstances, allow these contemplated federal policies to be inflicted upon Albertans. Anybody who thinks that it is going to be phased out or just transition, it's not going to happen. 2035 is just simply not realistic. All this is doing is just causing unfairness. We want to be treated equally. We developed this legislation to shield the province from federal intrusions, and we're using it now because the consequences of this particular overreach would be so severe. Another premier, but this time from Alberta, Danielle Smith is number four on our list. Uh, Laura, you heard all of the clips there. Um, you know, she, she won her election uh, earlier this year uh, by holding on sort of in Calgary and pushing back the NDP. Uh, but she has been at the center of a, every federal provincial conflict since she got into office. 
Yeah, she, she truly has. I mean, Danielle Smith has decided that the federal government is her opponent. There is no opponent for her in Alberta, and she is going to go up against the feds for every possible thing she can. I also, you know, I think we have to call out what the what her campaign team accomplished in in getting Danielle Smith elected as premier. Um, that was incredibly impressive campaigning to take someone and and have her frankly reject her natural libertarian populist inclinations, stick to script and and really just drive the message home time and time again. But she's also pushing a national agenda at this point that is really, you know, a little bit terrifying to watch and also really impressive to watch the way she dominates the national news cycle for a provincial premier. Well, Sherelle, when you look at the key industries in Alberta and you look at the climate agenda of the federal government and really the global climate agenda coming out of COP28, um, she is going to be at the center of everything uh, for as long as she's in that office, it seems. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as, as you know, for fellow conservative um, aligned premiers have been before, um, it's and well, and to be fair, and Rachel Notley, I mean, she was in, in the sure. NDP premier. It's, once you start talking about the oil and gas industry, you're talking about Alberta, you're talking about fossil fuels, you're talking about phasing them out, you're talking about a just transition, sustainable jobs, whatever it is that the current nomenclature is for that now. Mm -hmm. um, this is going to be something that is going to drive a national conversation to a degree. Um, I won't say that that it's going to completely overshadow everything, but they will make themselves heard. And I think that's where the, the difference is, that the Albertans and Daniel Smith are going to make themselves heard, whether or not it actually has any real effect or impact on, you know, federal policies. Because at this point, because it's always been such a contentious and kind of head-to-head -head, uh, relationship, I think the federal government, especially when, you know, when there's the liberal government, they just assume, okay, Alberta's going to disagree. Alberta's going to raise a fuss. Um, there's nothing really that we can do, right. you know, we can build and buy a Trans Mountain pipeline. It doesn't matter. We are going to get that pushback from Alberta. Um, so how do we move forward and not let them dominate the air, uh, the airwaves? Because there are, you know, various boogeymen that Danielle Smith has put up, you know, the Sovereignty Act, we haven't seen that, you know, fully roll out. Um, but there's all these kind of red flags that they're waving saying, hey, if you mess with us, we're going to do X, Y, Z. We haven't seen it yet, mm. but they are very much making themselves heard. But Tim, there is the, the, the threat of litigation, right? I mean, I know Alberta was part of the losing side of the carbon tax uh, fight, but, you know, they, they won on the reference case on the uh, impact assessment agency. They've won at the federal court on the plastics ban. So aside from political disruption, they can also have legal disruption, potentially, the government policy. That's not entirely unusual, though. No, We've no. seen provinces go down that path before. I think the challenge for Daniel Smith, though, is eventually going to be delivery. Like every other Alberta premier, and Jason Kenney discovered this uh, and, and, and felt the wrath of it, you can howl at Ottawa, you can go at Ottawa, and you you need to do that if you want to get elected in Alberta, but you need to deliver at a certain point. Mm -hmm. The challenge for Danielle probably in about two years is, all right, you've, you've made an aggressive case against Ottawa. What have you brought home to Alberta? What have you arrested in terms of the development of climate regulations that are inhibiting uh, the oil and gas industry? And she still, I, I agree with Laura that the campaign was, was excellent, and she did come from behind. Don't forget, at some point, she was uh, 10 points <laughs> behind. Yeah. However, Danielle still has to watch out for her worst instincts, which is to throw out her own landmines and then step on them. An example, the, <laughs> the, the Canada pension plan nonsense. Yes. Right? Oh, yeah. that, that hardly, I mean, that's gone quiet now because I think as people in Alberta who maybe hadn't thought about it much before now thinking, all right, well, we're not really going to get 53% of this. And if we did even get that, it would be of lesser value because it's taken out of the hole, so our pension is going to be worth less. So do we really want that? She's got to watch, and she's not alone in that, um, the, the posturing that can be a real problem for you and sink you in the end. Right. Uh, but, you know, she, she gets uh, attention. Like, whether it's new or not, it is she is a newsmaker because she is this is why maker. she's number yes, four. Absolutely. You know, just recently she called Stephen Gobo, Jordan, a menace uh, to the Alberta economy and a menace to national unity. So, <laughs> it, 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 well, she kind of reminds me of, 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 of Danny Williams back in yeah, Newfoundland, right? Sure. Like, she's going to pick the fight. Flags are going down next. And she's going to get the attention and she's yeah. going to get on the agenda. Well, and this is, I, I think, you know, part of the challenge for her is knowing when these things are better as rhetorical yes. devices mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and when they are actually a practical thing. And this is where the Sovereignty Act 
um, you know, may, may not actually survive contact with reality, right? So the minute that it, it turns from, from a, a political device for her into something that she has to implement, I think she's going to run into trouble. And the other interesting thing, of course, that happened this year that we haven't talked about yet for her is the changes within the UCP. Mm -hmm. So in a very strange set of circumstances, she now finds herself to actually be a moderate voice within the party. Yeah, because the Take Back That's Alberta. Right. Take Back groups, Alberta yeah. has taken over the UCP. And so this, uh, you know, may not have immediate consequences, but when you have people in control of the levers of the party and of rules around party leadership who are much more extreme, even than mm -hmm. Danielle Smith, and who are looking to actually push forward very specific policies, they're going to be wanting to see results on that soon. And I think, you know, her position there, as we've seen in the past in Alberta, is, is not always uh, something to take for granted. So that's something that I'll really be watching in the coming year. All right. OK. Uh, good point. And, and a good point earlier about the campaign team. Steve Athouse, the campaign manager. And Laura, I think Jason Leader from Enterprise might have played a role in that. <laughs> it's good for you to get that in. All right. That wraps up number four. Who's number three on our list of top five newsmakers of 2023? Stick around and find out. That's next. Welcome back to this special holiday edition of Power and Politics. Today, we're taking you through the top five Canadian newsmakers that dominated politics in 2023. So far, we have Ontario Premier Doug Ford at number five and Alberta Premier Daniel Smith at number four. And now for our number three newsmaker this year. We've raised rates rapidly, and now it's time to pause and assess our messages, plan for inflation to coming back, come back down, plan for price stability. Our decision to raise the policy rate reflected the persistence in both excess demand and underlying inflationary pressures. This is not the news that any Canadian wanted to receive this morning. What's the ramification of this when these people have to renew their mortgages? This is devastating news for families that have debt. We decided to hold the policy rate today. Higher interest rates are slowing the economy and that's cooling inflation. And number three on our list goes to Bank of Canada Governor Tiff Macklem. The special holiday edition of the Power Panel is back with Tim Powers, Jordan Leichnitz, Sherelle Evelyn, and Laura D'Angelo. Uh, Sherelle, um, Tiff Macklem has had quite the run as the Governor of Bank of Canada. He went from hikes to a pause to more hikes to another pause, and that has had a profound impact on Canadian politics. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that, you know, the Prime Minister would love to be able to meddle in the Bank of Canada. <laughs> he would love nothing more than to be able to put his thumb on the scale and say, you know what, these interest rates are going to come down and they're going to come down right this minute. Um, or at least he would have been able like, to say, you know, they weren't going to rise at the rate at which they did. However, he does not have that ability um, as much as, you know, other politicians like to say that he has more influence than he does. Um, but because of... of, of Tiff Macklem's uh, and, the, you know, the bank's uh, decisions that have been made, that has had a, a real impact on how, you know, the Conservatives have been able to position themselves mm -hmm. against the Liberals in terms of saying, you know what, the, the cost of living is far too high and it is Justin Trudeau's fault. Um, he, Tiff Macklem does, no longer seems to have Pierre Polyev calling for him to be fired every few seconds, which I'm sure maybe might help him sleep better at night. However, he does <laughs> have, you know, every, at, ahead of every, you know, uh, rate decision. In, you know, a string of premiers and other politicians sending yeah. letters, putting out statements. There's a bunch of pen pals now in exactly. provincial capitals. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Saying, you know, don't don't raise the rates. People in our, our constituents cannot handle this anymore, which, again, hurts the independence or the appearance of the independence of the bank. So in, in addition to, you know, making the decision, which I'm sure must be a, a very difficult decision every, you know, every quarter when he does make yeah. when these rates go up, he has to think about how is the bank being perceived on a global scale? Do people think that, you know, that this institution is as independent as it actually is? And that's that's not something that, you know, is easily glossed over. Yeah, Laura, the, the threat to fire him from, from Mr. Polyev was really for the actions of his predecessor, Stephen Pola. So I, I'm not sure if that's still a, a live promise. Uh, but the premiers, this is a whole new thing, right, that the premiers are now weighing in in advance of rate decisions and writing letters and voicing their displeasure. And, and there is this more overt attempt by politicians to try to influence the governor of the Bank of Canada these days. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if anyone needs more proof that affordability is the number one issue for Canadians, Tiff Macken being on this list at all is, is that proof. Mm -hmm. um, and the reality is he now has an immense amount of influence on public opinion. And 
as we all know, politicians respond to public opinion. And so they are going to do everything they can, even if it's just a letter that the Bank of Canada isn't really going to respond to. But if it's a letter that shows constituents and, and Canadians that they're doing their best, they're going to start pushing on that, especially because no Canadian wants to be told you can't afford your groceries or your mortgage or you have to sell your home. Mm -hmm. Because of the Bank of Canada decision, I can't help you at all in any way. No one wants to be told that. Um, and no premier or federal politician wants to wear that. Yeah, and Jordan, like, you know, Tiff Macklem, I, I, I take him at his word that he's acting in the best interest of meeting the mandate of getting inflation back to normal. Uh, but, you know, his choice to announce a pause at the beginning of the year and then hike rates in June and July, that's when the whole political support for the government came on hinge yes, and I think changed. Yes, that's where right? the bottom fell out. Yeah, it's a all. catalyzing event in yeah, a lot of ways. absolutely. And I think, I mean, <clears throat> it's a challenge, right? Because he is bound by his mandate. But I think that there's now, we're now seeing a very legitimate public debate about whether that mandate is exactly the right one. Is mm -hmm. the 2% target what we need to be driving so hard at? And, you know, of course, the bank has a band, right, between 1% and 3% of, of inflation that might be acceptable in Canada. So there are those out there arguing that 3% would be a more appropriate target given the cost of living pressures that Canadians are facing. And I think that that's a really legitimate debate. But in terms of, of, of Macklem himself, you know, really all he's got a, is a hammer, and that's yep. interest rates. And so every problem for him is a nail. And it means that it's really an imperfect tool when you're looking at the entirety of the inflation problem in Canada and then how that morphs into a cost of living problem. You're never going to solve it entirely through, through rate increases. And so I think it's a really huge challenge. And it's been very interesting to see that it's, you know, it's not just talking points, right? You're getting premiers like Eby and Ford who are now going out and advocating for something different. You're also seeing labor leaders like yeah. Canadian Labor Congress President B. Bruce going out and saying, hey, you know, you can't argue that wage inflation uh, is something that, that can't happen in Canada. We need to make sure that workers are keeping pace with this rising cost of living. So it's a very complicated picture overall. But at the end of the day, it means that Tiff Macklin is, is the most likely person to knock off Trudeau, uh, perhaps <laughs> indirectly, <laughs> yeah. after this year. You know, Tim, I, I wonder about the Bank of Canada in that, um, you know, politicians and people will debate its mandate and whether mm -hmm. that needs to change. I wonder if the bank needs a different communications approach in terms of speaking to Canadians, right? Like, uh, when, I, when I see Tiff Macklem do an interview, he's speaking to the business press, you know, the people who already understand this stuff. And there's not that sort of broader explanation of rationale to the ordinary Canadian public. And so the politicians are kind of filling that void. Yeah, it's funny, though. I'll answer that in a second. I was thinking about the letters. Tiff Macklin gets more letters from premiers than Santa gets from kids. Mm. Uh, and he hands out coal and not presents to the <laughs> to, to Canadians, it seems. Um, yeah, he's not, Tiff Macklin is not Mark Carney or he's not David Dodge, two former bank governors who, yes, could speak to the business community, could speak internationally, but both um, Mark and David Dodge have the ability to communicate and tell stories on a, on a more personal level. But in fairness to Mr. Macklin, he's been made a political actor because people want him to be a political absolutely. actor. Absolutely, yes. The absolutely. premiers don't want to wear the blame for affordability. The, the uh, prime minister doesn't want to wear the uh, blame for the affordability crisis. Pierre Polyev wants to go after him because he can put the pieces together and create this picture of an incompetent liberal uh, liberal regime. So he's, he's damned if he do, he does, and damned if he doesn't. Um, uh, but that's the lot he <laughs> has chosen when he accepted yeah. this particular role. I look. I we won't know for another five years if his policy choices were the right ones. But what we do know is there are three million Canadians over the next eighteen months who are going to have to renew their mortgages, and those three million Canadians are going to have much higher rates, likely, depending when they start renewing them, yeah. than when they got them originally. And that's going to cause potentially all sorts of political pain, both for the federal government and the premiers in which these uh, jurisdictions in which these three million people are. Th though on a positive note, the long-term indicators are starting to bend down. Bend Mortgage down. rates are starting to bend down as inflation not is bent down. 1%, though, not 2%. No, well, but, you know, maybe that was part of the problem. Yeah. You know, a 1% mortgage lets you maybe buy a house you shouldn't have bought. You know, that, that could David, be a part of the issue, David, when you bought too, that right? house and you got it yeah, at 1 no. or 2%, yeah. you think that's your inherent right. Yeah, no, I hear you. Uh, look, I redid my mortgage this year, and uh, I am poor now. All right, that was uh, <laughs> number three. Uh, yeah, thanks. thanks. Uh, I'm not alone in that club. All right, that was our, our number three uh, newsmaker. The number two top Canadian newsmaker of 2023 is up next, so stay right there.
Welcome back to this special holiday edition of Power and Politics. Today we're taking you through the top five Canadian newsmakers of 2023. So far we have Ontario Premier Doug Ford at number five, Alberta Premier Danielle Smith is number four, and Bank of Canada Governor Tiff Macklem at number three. Now, who could be number two on our list of top Canadian political newsmakers of the year? Let's find out. Billions of dollars that we're putting forward in new money for the provinces. The investments that are going to help in Windsor, in St. Thomas. Building more homes. The grocery rebate is going out across the country. David Johnston is an eminent Canadian. It is a shame to see the level of uh, toxicity and political polarization. Putting forward the strongest possible team of, uh, with uh, fresh energy. Oh, oh, person. Person. oh yeah. How's he yeah. doing? Oh, well. Conservative politicians are arguing that Canada needs to do less to fight climate change. There will absolutely not be any other carve outs or suspensions of the price on pollution. I always say we should have, could have moved faster. Absolutely. There's always more to do. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau comes in at number two on our list. The special holiday edition of the Power Panel is back with Jordan Leichnitz, Sherelle Evelyn, Tim Powers, and Laura D'Angelo. Uh, Tim, it, it's a rare political year when the Prime Minister is number two, but it's also a rare political year uh, for this Prime Minister because for the first time since he's been there, loudly and openly facing questions about his future. Where do you think he is? Yeah, I, I, you would have to say of his eight years in power, this has been the toughest one for him, mm. both professionally and personally. There were changes in his personal life, of course, that no doubt affected him in different ways. And right. I think we all have, can understand and respect that. But on the political front, yeah, he, he went from being a, there had been mistakes before, there had been missteps before, but basically most of this year looked like a litany of misfires uh, and puts him in this place as we go into 2024 where now people who once viewed him as the greatest electoral asset of the Liberal Party over the last decade, which he's been, and by the way, polls still suggest that he is, are now questioning that. And that questioning isn't coming from me or Sherelle or you or uh, Laura or anybody else or Jordan. It's coming from his own party. And mm -hmm. when that starts in a Liberal Party, that's a dangerous thing. Now, um, you played the clip there, of course, where he was joking about, oh, Percy, how's he? Of course, yeah, that Percy, Percy is Percy Down, the former chief of staff, who in a way started this off when he uh, published an article suggesting the prime minister ought to contemplate his future and perhaps in that contemplation should step down. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what Justin Trudeau is going to do. I, I mm -hmm. think he still probably has the benefit of the doubt from his own team until early uh, in the spring, but after that, if he hasn't decided to move on or hasn't given people a compelling reason why he's going to stay and right at the ship, uh, I think it's going to be very hard for him right. to continue to lead this government and the Liberal Party. Uh, Laura, see, things internally, uh, based on my conversations, seem to be at their worst during the summer, going up to the caucus retreat in London, the cabinet shuffle, and, and all that period of time. But the filibuster the Conservatives did at the end of the year seemed to have galvanized the Liberal caucus a little bit and given them some energy. How do you think that plays into Justin Trudeau's narrative as this year comes to an end and we go into 2024? I, I actually think that filibuster and that line-by-line -line vote helped the Liberals a lot. I think it was a pretty big mis miscalculation on the part of the Conservatives. Um, one, it gave the Liberals, frankly, a lot of oppo to talk about. Um, and, you know, sort of opposition fodder there. But two, I also think it reminded liberals what mm -hmm. kind of fun it is when they're all banded, banded together and how much fun the prime minister can be when he's in that environment. The, the other thing I think that we're seeing, you know, not just with that filibuster, but over the last few weeks are, you know, Pierre Pauly have had a bad few weeks and ships don't turn automatically. It takes week by week and it takes time. Um, and I think that coming out of that and heading into the holidays is the type of um, confidence boost the Liberal caucus needs heading into the new year. So, uh, Sherelle, they may get a bit of a confidence boost, you know, internally. Uh, the underlying numbers and challenges they're facing are still quite severe and very real. What, what's your sense of where the Prime Minister is right now? 
yeah, to to Laura's point, there was there is that bit of a boost, and I think that was important. Um, we don't often, or we haven't seen um, the kind of the political animal that we know Justin Trudeau to be. Um, mm -hmm. The fire that's usually yeah. lit under him has been kind of more of like those you know little embers instead of like a full blaze. And throughout, whether it's you know the cabinet shuffle, the reset, to the cabinet retreat, to the caucus retreat, there was the sense of like, oh, wait and see, we're really we're just priming the engine. Let's we're we're, we're coming out with something. We're gonna go. We're, here we go we're one more time let's yeah. and no nothing really nothing was really happening um and i think that's what people haven't um been able to grasp onto so you know kind of at the risk of sounding like a conservative mp after eight long years <laughs> you know do does justin trudeau have that fire to keep going i think he does i think when he um gets into a political fight that's where we kind of see him at its best but he hasn't really been fighting and people haven't had a reason to to believe Believe in him, and I think that's both publicly and you know, and internally within the caucus. And it's when you're constantly having to put out those own internal fires, yeah. um, and and these are things that aren't going away. We saw it in recent weeks with the UN vote. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to that's caused you know even more uh, internal strife. These are things that are really going to have. He's going to have to do a lot of work to keep uh, to keep this group together, and he needs to you know, beef up that energy to do it. Yeah, Jordan, you stuck with the challenges of being political, but also governing mm -hmm. uh, as a series of, of difficult issues are happening. And as Sherelle kind of pointed out, it was like a, a car spinning in the snow uh, for a while. His reason for staying seems to be to beat Pierre Polyev, though. Like, that is what he is laying out in all the year-end interviews. Well, yeah, and I, and I think that it will be a turn if he actually decides that he wants to do that. Because mm -hmm. I think one of the major challenges that he and, and the party more broadly has faced is that he hasn't really shown up as that fighter this year. The government has been missing a narrative about their purpose, their direction. What is the point of them? What are they doing for Canadians? And you could see at various points they tried to articulate different things. And, you know, we've seen some success, for example, um, coming out of the shuffle that having Sean Fraser on housing, yeah. he's out there charting a really solid path, a good narrative and delivering on that. But it's been uneven, right? You haven't seen the same kind of discipline and execution on the issue, for example, of grocery prices. That's been fumbled now a few times. And it's very difficult to see the government getting their communications game together when their main communicator mm -hmm. can't seem to get out from underneath the government's own errors. And so I think that he has, uh, you know, as others have suggested, he's got maybe a very narrow window into the spring to show up as his full and best campaigning self before the leadership speculation uh, turns more from a whisper into a dull roar. Laura, what do you make of that? I, we, we hear that a lot, that the prime minister has until the spring or, you know, I, and, and I, I'm not sure if I disagree with it or agree with it or not, but like, is that a real thing? Is that an internal clock ticking in his head and the head of Katie Telford and the people around him? Is that a caucus clock? I, I mean, who, who do you think ultimately has that conversation with him? Or is there someone to have that conversation with him about whether he should stay or go? It's a, it's a great question. I don't know if there's a specific person to uh -huh. have that conversation yeah. with them. I think more, more to Tim's point, we're looking at more of, you know, maybe caucus revolt or, you know, sort of a broader movement that it's time for a new leader. In terms of the clock, I don't actually think there's this guiding internal clock. The general wisdom seems to be that, you know, this government is going to go all the way to spring or fall 2025 before there's an election. And so I think when you look at that timing, it makes sense that spring 2024 is the time when, mm -hmm. you know, he has to make a decision and there's not a lot of runway to an election after that. That's not a lot of time to elect a new leader, right. have that new leader, you know, establish their own brand and narrative and story, and also have all of these candidates, 338 candidates, although under the new rules, more, um, follow them and, and be ready to be team players. Tim, do you think he, he does run as leader in the next election? I know 2025 is a long way away. I, I feel that he will. Yeah, I, I think it's what you said earlier. I think he relishes that fight against yeah. Pierre Polyev. And sometimes everything else can be rational uh, and it makes sense that you may go, but it's the irrational that governs you. He likes to fight. He is proven as a good political campaigner. He should never be dismissed. I think he thinks he can pull out the Pierre Polyev of circa 2008, uh, the, the irritating pugilist opposition member that perhaps isn't as favorable to the public as the current leader of the Conservative Party is.
Yeah, uh, it would be an interesting campaign because I think it would be the first conservative leader with the energy and the industry to mm -hmm. match Justin Trudeau on the campaign trail. It could actually it box better than Patrick Brazo, <laughs> probably. I, 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 I don't think we need to go back to there. Okay, uh, so the Prime Minister gets number two on our list, but our number one top Canadian political newsmaker of the year is up next. Guess who that might be right after this. Welcome back to this special holiday edition of Power and Politics. Today, we're taking you through the top five Canadian newsmakers that dominated politics in 2023. So far, we have Ontario Premier Doug Ford at number five, Alberta Premier Daniel Smith at number four, Bank of Canada Governor Tiff Macklem at number three, and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau at number two. And now, the number one political newsmaker of 2023. Today's humiliating climb down that we have forced Trudeau to make. Stand up for our history, get connected to reality, and keep the images in our passport. Take the money away from subsidizing heroin-like drugs. I sent Johnson a letter, said, how are you gonna investigate foreign interference in the Trudeau Foundation when you were part of the Trudeau Foundation? How much will the average family see their monthly mortgage payments go up? Who's ready to ax the tax? It's Justin Trudeau who should have been fired. It took him eight years to cause this housing hell. Rent has doubled, mortgage payments have doubled, down payments have doubled. Everything's broken after eight years of Trudeau. Pause his carbon tax for some people on some fuels for some period of time. That's what I said in my remarks. You're right, it was a media report. Stop interfering with the independence of the Senate and let the bill pass. Why won't they stop sending Canadians the bill and let Canadians afford to eat, heat, and house themselves? In the number one spot, leader of the Conservative Party and leader of the official opposition, Pierre Polyev. The special holiday edition of the Power Panel is back with Laura, Tim, Jordan, and Sherelle. And Sherelle, you look at those old clips, you almost forget about the glasses now that, uh, you know, we're at the end of, of 2023. Are you trying to tell us something? Uh, no, no, it's just, you know, there's, there's been the, 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 the stylistic makeover, attempts at a tonal makeover, mm -hmm. that has had mixed success, but there's no question Pierre Polyev drove the political story at the federal level in Canada in 2023. Absolutely. And, you know, based on the polling, based on, you know, headlines, everything, it kind of gives the impression um, this far out from an election that this is Pierre Polyev's, you know, race to lose. Mm -hmm. And so to that end, people are starting to pay more attention. And I don't know if people are necessarily liking what they see. That's yet to be determined. Um, I know that there's been some shifts in recent weeks that have, that have suggested that now that people are paying attention, they're maybe not so keen. Um, but again, we, have, we do have a long runway. However, what we don't know yet is how Pierre Polyev is going to play on a on a national scale. We know he's loved by his base. Yes. We know the Conservative Party and, you know, the right wing are behind him. We know that he's picking up people who are concerned about the cost of living. He's been driving these pocketbook issues from, you know, the second he started campaigning to be Tory leader in 2022. Um, we know that he's following a lot of some of the similar things we've seen in the U.S. in terms of, uh, you know, playing against the media, denigrating journalists, you know, using social media very effectively, all those types of things. We don't yet know if those are going to be things that people are going to latch onto in as much the same way that they did in the United States. Right. We don't know if it's going to matter if because that ultimately, you know, the Trudeau government has been in power for a while and people in this country, they vote governments in, they don't uh, vote governments out, sorry, they don't vote governments in. And he just might be very well placed at the right, you know, the right person at the right time at the right point in, in this government to, to, you know, be the one who beats uh, the right. prime minister. We don't know. But, like you said, he's driving the conversation and he's doing it very, very effectively. Yeah, Tim, he's been able to harness uh, public opinion and build a lead by laser focusing on affordability <clears throat> and housing and a couple of key issues. The question is, is it durable as scrutiny becomes laser focused on him over the next little while? Well, in context, it's also important here. Fifteen years ago, only two entities would have thought Pierre Polyev would be in the position to be prime minister himself and as a mirror. Uh, nobody else would have would have bought this, and, and I mean it's imp it's impressive, right? Yeah. Uh, where just just into the data for a second, he um, uh, for all of the last five months has basically had commanding leads in every demographic, uh, in every age demographic, um, in various sectors. 
and among women. I mean, uh, yeah. this is a, the, the, this is not something that often happens for conservative leaders. And among millennials and Gen Zs, why is that important? Because that's where the liberals have won elections in the past. And it, it, a lot of that groundwork, it hasn't just been the collapse of the liberals started in his leadership campaign. Remember. To be fair to him, I think he deserves some credit for getting on the affordability train early and finding out that the millennials and Gen Zs in particular, who had voted for the liberals um, mostly around climate change and the middle class getting stronger, were not finding that was happening. And they were worried about potentially buying homes and about their jobs. And he's been consistent on that. Uh, his challenge will be, one, to protect the lead that he has and not let it diminish and also restrain his worst instincts. He does like the rough and tumble. He does like the cutting, sarcastic put down that will not play well necessarily outside of his base. Right. Um, but I think he's demonstrated enough thus far that he's prepared to learn, uh, much as Stephen Harper learned between 204 when he lost to Paul Martin and when he won in 206. The last thing I'd say, David, as much as um, Justin Trudeau relishes a fight against Pierre Polyev. I think the other is true, Absolutely. too. Absolutely. Pierre Polyev yeah. wants to go at Justin Trudeau, and he also should not be underestimated. And I think uh, the, the, the Liberal Party, being late to the game and defining Polyev, uh, waiting for him to appear in the true colors as they envisioned them, have made a huge mistake letting him have this much runway so far. Yeah, Jordan, he has instincts, he has drive, he has communication skills, and he has the industry to match Justin Trudeau. Yeah, there's no question. This has been his year. And I think, you know, to what Tim is saying, a big part of the inaction on the liberal side is that there's a certain incredulity that we could be beaten by this yeah, guy right. in particular. And I, I think that's really dangerous for the liberals because it means that they haven't actually been out there prosecuting the case against Polyev with Canadian voters. So he's really had free reign over this year to define himself and to introduce himself to voters. And you've seen, you've certainly seen some false starts. You know, early in the year, they poured a lot into the foreign interference story that I don't think actually yielded them very much. You know, they've had, of course, you know, more recently missteps, I think, on the Ukraine file, um, other things as well, where maybe he's he's given in a little bit more to some of his instincts that are less appealing to voters and presented himself as more combative and negative than he necessarily needs to. But by and large, I think the advice that he's getting, and you can really see it because they put $3 million behind it yeah, in an right. ad campaign in the summer to soften those rough edges, to pour him into that tight t-shirt and get him out there, <laughs> um, and to really reintroduce himself as, as not the skippy that we all knew on Parliament Hill, uh, you know, 10 years ago. Go, but a but a serious minded person who is also relatable and I think that overall that's really where uh, where he's ended the year now he's got challenges in front of them though it is early this mm -hmm. is a very big lead early on so can he maintain that um, and then the other challenge I think is exactly what what Tim said which is that it's clear that there are moments where his instincts run counter to the advice that he's getting that has been helping get him over the top in the last half of the year. Like in scrums with reporters. That's right, where he's, you know, picking a fight. He's just generally, you know, he's being unpleasant. And you're seeing, you know, for example, the the uh, the Apple thing, right, with the reporter where the party cut that and pushed that out. It was very popular with their base, but not necessarily something that resonates with voters more broadly. So he also has to be careful to, to temper that and to yep. keep his vote coalition together, which has to necessarily include some of those Maxime Bernier voters, mm -hmm. uh, he needs a few of those back, but then he also needs to reach back into the mainstream and get some of those center-right and centrist voters uh, who are unhappy with the liberals. Laura, uh, Pierre Polyev, the biggest challenge uh, your party has faced uh, since winning government in 2015, the newsmaker of the year. What's your take? Certainly. I mean, I think it's remarkable that the top two newsmakers of the year, one and two, are also probably two of the most controversial politicians. <laughs> Canadian memory um, for very different reasons. Um, and I, I think that's, I mean, one, it's remarkable that Pierre Polyev is number one. He is driving the narrative across the board right now. And, you know, despite as liberal loving watching the last few weeks that weren't maybe so great for him, um, he is formidable and he is proving himself to be formidable, I think, in a way that no one really expected, even people who said he did pretty well in leadership. No one expected this level of talent um, to be sustained, I think, for the entire year. Um, what I do think is interesting is what Jordan was pointing out, which is this is a very high lead. 
very far away from an election. And it will be tough, I think, to maintain that through world events, right? Depending on what happens with inflation, depending on what happens with housing. Mm -hmm. And in addition, to Tim's point, and I think as a Politico, the thing I love to watch is that they are they are relishing this fight with each other. Right. And they are it is really a head-to-head -head battle almost daily at this point. There are other people trying to step in and, and do that a little bit, like Melissa Lansman and Karina Gould. Um, but really what we are seeing are the top communicators on both sides of the party going head-to-head -head on a daily basis. And to see this kind of rhetoric from both parties this far out, it is going to be a long road yeah. with two really talented campaigners, really talented politicians who, when they are both on their A game, you know, this is going to take over the national narrative, almost despite what's happening everywhere else. Yeah, no, uh, that's a good point. That's a good place to end it. I mean, the liberals are counting on the country not being able to stay as angry as it is until 2025. <laughs> They better hope they're right, because if there's anger out there, Polyev knows how to speak to it. All right, I want to thank our special holiday edition of the Power Panel, Sherelle Evelyn, Jordan Leichnitz, Tim Powers, and Laura D'Angelo. I am David Cochran. Thank you all for watching this special holiday edition of Power and Politics. Have a good night.